Welcome back to Not So Fresh Off the Boat. Last week we talked about DACA and the history of immigration. This week's episode we dive into generational differences among immigrant parents and their children, as well as mental health and fitting in. We would like to extend a warm welcome to our first guest, Nathan Souk, who's going to tell us a little bit about his family who emigrated from Cambodia and Laos. Thank you and enjoy the show. So, welcome back to Not So Fresh Off the Boat. I'm your host, Pedro Garcia, joined by my co host, Chris Ariola. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Nathan. Nathan, uh, do, you don't care like if we do last names? You don't want to stay anonymous? Care. Yeah. What's your, what's your last name? Souk? Souk, yeah. All right, Nathan Souk with us here. Um, so, fuck. Okay, let me start over. I'm getting hot. Hold on. <laughs> It's that crew neck, dude. That shit looks warm as hell. I think I wore this shirt last time. Yeah, but it's that crew neck, dude. That crew neck looked way too warm for just, like, messing around your room. Well, my room is notorious for having the least insulation in my house, so it always gets, like, way colder in here. Oh, um, so it's just because you're nervous? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm flushed, and I, like, want to perform well, and also, like, I'm kind of nervous because Nathan's here. And I just want to be funny and on yeah, top of it. It's chill, Also, man. you'll notice a new mic setup. Uh, for the last two episodes, my face has been covered, so I took off my glasses, got rid of the mic, got this mic, and now we're doing good. So, Nathan. Yeah, Xander, so eat shit. Yeah, eat shit, Xander. Um, but yeah. So, we've got Nathan Suk with us today. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about um, why you would be on a podcast called, called Not So Fresh Off the Boat? Yeah. So, uh, as Pedro said, I'm Nathan. I was born and raised in Oregon. I've been a long time friend of Chris since middle school. Um, I believe we've gone through a bunch of social issues with each other. And yeah, um, didn't really realize it until our later years in life. We're like, wow, our childhood sucked. No. <laughs> but uh, we're here to discuss that. You know, it's it's life. You, you realize what's wrong and what's right with growing up. That's yeah, just all about getting mature. It is. Um, it is always that random, like whether you had like stuff um, provided for you materially. It is always that random, like there's always one moment. I don't know what happens. You reach like the age of like maybe twenty, nineteen, where you're like, damn, wait, shit was fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> you're just like taking a shower and you're like, hold up, was that a microaggression? <laughs> just like you're thinking like, of something that happened like years ago. <laughs> you're like that thing that Dylan told me in eighth grade. Did he mean that? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, so um, not to steal your thunder here, but I do have a little story that I just thought, like, I remembered it um, the like yesterday. I was watching something in Spanish and like a guy cursed and it brought back this flashback to in seventh grade. I was waiting for the bus and there was this. Um, it was like like a white kid and this Mexican kid chilling and. Like they were older, they were in eighth grade and they were talking to me and somehow I got to the topic of my race and the guy, like the white guy was like, I, I, it wasn't as insensitive as like, so what are you? But something along those lines. And I was like, oh, like I'm kind of shy, like a little chubby kid. And I was like, oh, I'm Mexican. And then the white guy turns to the Mexican dude and he's like, he's like, how, like, how can we verify this? How can we check his credentials? And the... Um, like the other, like the Mexican guy was just like going through and asking me to say like curse words in Spanish to just like make sure that I knew. But the thing is, like, I didn't curse very much. So, like, because I didn't pass the test, he was like, guy, oh, yeah, this guy's not Mexican. And, uh, and then I was like eating lunch, I was eating a salad, and I was like, damn, that's kind of fucked up. <laughs> so, and so anyway, so that brings me to my next point. Do you have any, uh, anything like that? Maybe not obviously exactly like that, but anything. That happened in Oregon, similar to that for you, Nathan? Yeah, you know, like growing up, people always ask me, like, oh, what kind of Asian are you, dude? I'm like, uh, Cambodia. I'm like, no, where's Cambodia at? I'm like, Southeast Asia. Is that, is that by China? Is that by, by Japan? I'm like, no, nowhere near that. So it, it's just people aren't really informed about like the whole other regions of Asia, you know? Uh, they're mm -hmm. more uh, known of like the China, Japan. Uh, the Philippines, like I mentioned before our podcast. And, um, you know, whenever I mention my, my ethnicity, I tell them that I'm Cambodian and Laotian. And then when I tell them that I'm Laotian, they're like, oh, so you talk to the ocean? I'm like, ah, mm -hmm. mm, 
No, no, oh, what? not like that. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. So. Lay so, Ocean. He's yeah. of the ocean. Yeah. yeah. So you know what Lay Ocean is? Uh, people from Laos. So another Southeast Asian country. But yeah, I just kind of get weird, weird things like that, telling them about my ethnicity. Like I want to say that's like the kind of like low IQ, like not very creative thing that maybe a fifth grader would say. Mm-hmm. But I'm worried that you've heard that in your adult life as well. Yeah. <laughs> you have. Yeah, I, I have. Yeah. Fuck. Okay. I don't know why I had hope. And maybe last time you heard that was like sixth grade, but. <laughs> He's like, yeah, this happened yesterday. Yeah. No, that just happened at Walmart. <laughs> I was just, you know, I was just buying carrots, and the person just asked if I was of the ocean. <laughs> beep, beep. I come from the sea. So what are you? Beep, beep. Just like ringing your stuff up. <laughs> but, you know, so you, what are you guys, what are you guys up to today? Oh, also, what race are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this weather's been crazy, huh? So where are you from? No, where's your family from? <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of that too. Like, no, but where are you really from? Like, huh? Yeah, from that's Salem, Oregon, dude. See, and that's something that we, if you want to acknowledge the little bit of privilege we have, Pedro, is that, like, we are the apex of Latinos in the United States. Like, we're the default. So it's, like, the Mexican, because there are people that I've talked to that are Venezuelan or, um, who else, like, um, Guatemalan, that have the same feelings that Nathan has, but when it comes to, like, like Latin America, like everybody assumes they're fucking Mexican and that they like know Mexican shit. And if you're from Venezuela, you must like eat burritos and nachos and shit. Yeah. And the thing is like, it's hard to be mad because they're right. You know, like when they guess, like when someone automatically assumes you're Mexican, it's like, <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I can't, like how, I can't you, be upset you, about that. You, you how asshole, dare you guess I'm... correctly? <laughs> how dare you get it right on the first try? Like, what do you say to that? Like, yeah, that's really lame of you to play it easy and just lazily guess the right one the first time. I don't know <laughs> what would have led you to believe that, but good job. <laughs> oh shit, yeah. Um, let's keep talking about us. No, I'm just playing. so Nathan. <laughs> so obviously, like some insecurities can like stem from like constantly having those interactions because you were born in Salem, Oregon, right? I was born in Corvallis actually, and I kind of moved around. Like I lived in Albany. And I lived in Eugene, and then I moved in Salem. That's where I met Chris. And then moved back to Corvallis to go to college at OSU. Okay. So, kind of in, like, the same area, but everywhere just felt the same. Until, like, in college. And then I, I kind of got that identity realization of who, who I am. You know, like, meeting people of my own kind and, like, then making me find myself of who I come from or where I come from, you know. Yeah, because you, you joined a fraternity that was for Southeast Asian people, correct? Yeah, yeah. So that fraternity is mainly t- interested in Southeast Asian uh, descent. So they want people to make feel welcomed rather than joining the IFC, uh, white fraternity and sorority houses there. So it's more smaller than the house fraternities. Mm-hmm. So with yeah. okay, so with that uh, that fraternity, um, did you feel like it helped you get closer to your culture, or was like, is there anything they did that was like specifically different? Was it just, or you know what I mean, like from the white fraternities, like things they did that were like events or something that they held? Oh uh, yeah, so I, I was just part of the fraternity. I was also part of the multicultural clubs there, and we we're very um, supportive of one another because we want to be known, we want to be uh, prominent within the community. So we always held events, like cultural events. Um, we always helped each other out with with e- events, and just to make people known of our history and why why we're there. Like um, the people, we're not just one race; we're many races of, of Asians. So um, it's just acknowledging the community that we're here, and we're not just generalized as this type of Asian people. So going from this college experience where you're just like surrounded by, you know, people that share like your similar cultural identity and all this stuff, um, how is that, or like, 
where like where's your head at when you think back of like where you came from so you said you were moving around all these places and it all felt the same yeah. like can you go a little bit like into that uh i think a lot of us before coming to college we had a identity crisis like um like i growing up i wasn't around many asian people especially in elementary school middle school and then once i found like an asian pe- person in my school i'm like oh shit the fuck you know the asian people person here i might love a cambodian too i'm like I, I never felt this way because like I have cousins in California and there's it's like a big bigger population of Cambodians or a lot of people there. So they have like experience of being around the same people. Unlike me or, or Chris, we've only been around white people and like Latino people. So uh, I didn't get a really chance to connect with people of, of, of my kind and of my people. So when I came to college, I, I had similar interests with people too, like, oh shit. So we we have similar upbringings of of our parents, you know. I, I think one of the talking points is of, of our parents later in the podcast. Uh, I'll go more in depth of that. But um, yeah, just similar upbringings and where we come from and what um, what is it? This is uh, incidents we've gone through while growing up with with people. So that's how we connected in college. It's always so, it's always cousins, bro. It's yeah. always cousins that have it better. There's always a there's always, I don't know who claims to be the good cousin, but in my experience, it's always that too. It's always like, damn, dude, there's my fucking cousins that are just like squatting up with like people of the same race and feel welcomed and feel supported and know their heritage. Like, couldn't be me. <laughs> yeah, all my cousins are in Mexico, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> they're, they're just chilling with the entire populace. This Mexico. podcast is anti-cousin. Yeah, dude, we, we hate our cousins. <laughs> my cousins. All my homies hate my cousins. <laughs> <laughs> So was it like a seamless transition? Uh, sorry, like I to keep staying on this topic, but I'm just like, that's just because my college experience was that I just went to a community college where it was like the same, like instead of just like, like all the high schools just like just went there. Like if you didn't go to like a college outside of the city, you probably went to, to the, to this one. So it's like, yeah. um, I still didn't really, I, dude, I, I straight up did like, did, I just didn't have any friends, dude, all college until like maybe my last semester. I made some friends. We would play like Smash Brothers, um, and that's that's my story. <laughs> that's my college experience, no fraternity or anything like that. So was it like a seamless transition, or, or was there like a part of you that was like, oh, like I've been like so disconnected from my culture that like I'm having like a a rocky start here relating to to some people that like share my cultural background or anything like that. Yeah, definitely. Like I feel like some people during their first year they have a hard time uh, reaching out or kind of getting to know people, so they want to be more social and try these clubs, you know? I didn't really get into the clubs until my sophomore year. And then that's when I started being more social and then started connecting with these people because a lot of them came from the Portland metro area. So that's, or some of them already knew each other and they came to the Oregon state. So it was kind of clicky in the beginning. So it was kind of intimidating to kind of put your foot in the door and like, hey, I want to join too. But once you get in there, they're very welcoming because uh, they know what you're going through. They you want they want to be make you feel welcomed. So it's a very homey um, environment there. Okay. Um. Damn. That. Uh. I'm glad that you had that experience. That's also like honestly like, I, 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 it's nice to hear that you know, there there was that community there for you. It was like that envious um Arthur meme. He just got his fist. I, like why I'm not. I have that. <laughs> I'm not clenching my fists. Okay. But uh, so now where are you living? You're in South Carolina, right? Yeah, I recently moved to South Carolina back in July uh, after I graduated from OSU, go Beavs. Uh, but yeah, it's, the transition here is it's, it's something, you know, going from a blue state, moving to a, a red state where it's very conservative. Um, they, everybody's watching what you're doing. They always talk about what you're, what you're doing. And then they're not very... Like, uh, like strangers or like... Uh, your family like your family's like what is he doing what is yeah, this guy doing my family was like that because they're very family oriented like hey like, let's hang out like come over and eat but um i'm very introverted i, I stick to myself and my family was like what are you doing it was home alone Just come over i'm like i'm okay i'm all right <laughs> but yeah people are here they just very conservative they want to stick to the norms of life rather than back in Oregon. It's very PC and 
if you want to be politically cor correct with one another here or it's just generalized generalized um living you know they they're very fixated on that american dream like i'm just gonna work go on vacation come home watch tv go to sleep go to work. hate my wife yeah yep. <laughs> so like american hate your wife it's like yeah. pick your poison of racism like do you want like the blatant like a, a, like just like completely repressive racism of the south or do you want like just like eight million microaggressions a day yeah. of somebody that doesn't try to be racist in oregon yeah. but like does something racist like oh i'm so, uh, I, 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 you just get in like a bunch of those like interactions yeah, with white they, people like here one of my mom's friends was telling me about like she was talking to a, a black man and the black man he wasn't very educated about different colors of people you know he's like so I'm black, and that's white. But what are you? Are you yellow? Are you brown? Ooh. So yeah, so it's very different down here, you know. Like they they're not they're, they're very open about their racism like that. So I I don't know how would you would answer that without being um <laughs> like directly I don't know how to put it like not mad but mad at the same time for. But I can't be really mad at him because he's not educated about racism like that. Yeah. When not knowing, like, people like, like, that's a thing, too, is if you don't know people from, if you grow up in a place where it's literally just, like, like, for the most part, black or white, you know, and there's not really that much, like, difference besides that binary, then, yeah, it makes it even, even more, like, difficult. Oh, yeah. Not to be a computer nerd, but imagine just seeing ones and zeros your whole life, and then you see a two, dude. Yeah. Nathan's what are you going to do? What are you going to do, bro? Nah, you're a 10, Nathan. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Not that man. Wondering what you are. That's, that's a crazy conversation, dude. I don't even know what I would do in that, in, yeah. in that scenario. Like, what would you do? Was that, that show, what would you do, where, like, the host comes up at oh, the yeah. very end? Yeah. It's I would all, mind my it's business. All scripted, dude. Scr scripted scenarios where like some crazy shit happens. Yeah, I've watched a couple of those. There's one where like uh, these kids are like trying to, um, they're like making fun of one of their friends with a peanut allergy, and he goes to the bathroom, and they're like being really loud about like putting peanut butter in like his food or something, and like people are like, "Hey, you're gonna kill him! <laughs> like you're gonna commit murder!" And he comes out, he's like, "Hey, well, good job for stopping these boys from committing murder. What would you do?" Dude, some of them are like really fucked up. Like some, there was one where the they like had the they had like a a man bring like a girl into a diner, and they were trying to like insinuate by like her acting that she was being like held there against her will by the man and was like kidnapped. So they're like seeing if anybody would do something and like to help her because it seemed like she was like kidnapped. And I'm like, bro, like what the what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> like, shit, dude. Kind of I just don't want to know and what people would do if somebody spilled a dollar at the pocket. Is it just fell out? It's like, hey, you, I couldn't help but notice you kept that dollar. I'd be like, yeah, it didn't really have an effect on anyone. It's just a dollar. And, uh, <laughs> you know, like something super trivial. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, that man walked by and he didn't have his shoelaces tied. We noticed you didn't say anything. <laughs> okay, last cool. thing uh, about what, this what show. Would you do for, last thing for about this show. I'm pretty sure they film it all in the same area. And I just imagine that, like, that whole town is always on edge. And that crime rates have just dropped because everyone's always just like, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Xander, you the best can talk about that. Ep the best part about that show, though, is when they don't do anything. You learn that people, a lot of people are just, they'll just turn the other cheek. They see some horrible shit happening. I'll be honest, that'd be me. I'm not even going to pretend I'm some hero. <laughs> I, I, I just get scared. Not even scared. I'm just like, I don't want to deal with this. It, selfish. I'm selfish. Yeah. All right. And I said it. <laughs> and if I ever, yeah, I don't care. Anyway, so <laughs> let's, <laughs> Nathan, back to you. Um, so South Carolina, you're talking about living in South Carolina and things that are <laughs> happening in South Carolina. <laughs> but let's go back. Okay, let's turn that let's turn that dial back. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your parents? Yeah, so uh, I'm I'm a second gen second gen uh, Asian American living here. My parents and my grandparents were the first ones to come to America. Second gen, hold up. Nathan, Chris, a word. First gen, bro. First gen. Chris, a word. You said he was first gen. 
I'm second gen because my parents. No, no, but dude, so your parents having your parents were both born in a different country, correct? Yeah. Okay, so that makes you first gen. I'm first gen. Oh shit. Yeah. Second gen. No, the way the legal. Not legal. What the fuck am I saying? But the way it the way it works, that like by definition, Nathan is first gen. Damn, I've been tell, I've been told a lie. Yeah, you're not the person that comes doesn't they count as zero? Oh, gen zero. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, because you're yeah, first gen. You're first generation. Because Nathan's by like but the way like Nathan is first generation American. Yeah. Because he's not the first, first generation person. of your family. Yeah, because Nathan's the f- you would be the first person to be born in the United States. How does it feel to like find that out live on air? <laughs> it's like the the meme that the more you know, the <laughs> star shooting, ra- reading rainbow thing. Yeah, the more you know. Oh man, that's gonna be a good clickbait title. Yeah. <laughs> Nathan's not second gen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, anyways, moving on. Uh, yeah, my parents. And my grandparents, they immigrated here from Cambodia during the 1970s, like 75 through 79 genocide. That's when the whole war in Vietnam was happening. And what the history books don't tell you is the Khmer Rouge uh, genocide. Uh, that's, that's a whole other history lesson to be taught. That should be taught because my people were committing genocide on their own people because they were afraid of intellectuals taking over the country and progressing towards better better living uh better technology they wanted to keep the old ways the the golden age of how they were but then the government was like no we kill everybody who doesn't want to stay this way and so that's why people fled and that's why my parents are here because they didn't they didn't want to die (laughs) they didn't want to take the chances of being wrongly accused of wanting to change so they came here for the better life they came here to work hard uh give me the better life so i I was actually the first gen to go to college as well and first in my family to graduate college so congratulations dude that's a that's a great feeling yep w's in the chat w's yeah so uh now they're still fixated on the since we provided for you you're going to provide for us when you got you get established in your job, you making good money. So in the next couple of years I'll be providing for them. So yeah. That's that's the the way of living of the parents take care of the child, then the child takes takes care of the, the parents. Yeah, yeah, I mean I can um I can relate to that. My family, like back in Mexico, like in our house, our our grand my grandparents lived there too, and then the plan would have been like we grow up and then my, you know, I live with my parents until I'm married or like, you know, and then I just take care of them and then the cycle goes on. Yeah, you don't see a lot of that within American households where the grandparents live with the parents and the, the grandchildren. Dude, hell no. In the U.S. you get rid of that fucking person as quick as possible. Yeah, you put them in a nursing home. Uh, you just forget about them. You visit them once a month. Here, she's like, nah, grandma's living with us until she dies. <laughs> Which I, dude, I, honestly, at where I'm at in life, I'm, I'd be cool keeping that tradition up. I, you know, I love living with my parents. Um, yeah. And uh, for anyone that's going to give me shit, okay, I pay rent, okay? So, <laughs> you know, I'm just not a freeloader, okay? <laughs> Things are different, but they're not that different. Anyway, uh, I wouldn't mind that, but it's like, I feel like if you dated an American girl, and then you were like, oh, by the way, we're going to pull a Michael B. Jordan, and my parents are going to live with us. <laughs> You know, like, I don't know if they'd be cool with that if you weren't living in a Michael B. Jordan size house. That's true. I think the thing um, for me, I, my grandparents didn't live um, like with uh, my mom's parents because that's the grandparents I'm the closest with because they also live in Salem, Oregon. Um, but they've always lived close. And like when we've moved to Oregon from the Bay Area of California, we lived with them for a year while we looked for a house. Um and yeah, I, I agree that I think that that is a good, it's like a good family dynamic because I think, I think that's indispensable in making like me who I am is like that I had like elderly people to look like, like elders that I respected and that I could like confide in for advice that weren't just my parents. Like I feel like that grandparent relationship is like really important. 
I never really had that. I didn't really know my grandparents, but I'm gonna take your word for it. <laughs> I'm gonna take your word for it. That's like a pivotal, like like a crucial relationship someone should build in their life. Uh, but yeah, I never knew my parents. <laughs> so, so, uh, so just to the public, don't let your grandparents just die alone in a freezer. Dude, oh my god, I can't imagine being old and just like no one wants to hang out with you. You're just like a, like everything hurts and like you just don't have friends. Yeah, dude. Fuck that. It's like it'd be like right now, except right now my body doesn't hurt too much. Yeah, and then it's because then if you know if you have that family dynamic going on, you don't got to worry about putting any sort of money away for retirement. You're like, my kids are gonna take care of me. They're gonna get everything ready. I don't got to save shit. I'm gonna buy this air fryer right now. <laughs> um. Yeah. Four hundred one k. Uh. You mean my four kids? <laughs> <laughs> that was the worst joke I've ever told. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty bad. Uh, Xander, decide what we want to do with this one. <laughs> Xander, <laughs> kill me. <laughs> Xander, take the shot. <laughs> delete. <laughs> so, um, would you say there's like a huge? Like, would you say there's, like, a lot of differences between you and your parents? Whether it's, like, the uh, way like way of thinking, like, way of handling problems, the way you, like, navigate through life in general? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think Chris knows a little bit, like, coming over to my house, uh, like, every weekend just growing up. My, Chris has experienced my parents being a little racist towards every race, you know? But then I'm not going to call him out on him, like, all right, well, if, you, if I call you out, I don't know you're just going to turn into a lecture of how you're right and I'm wrong. That's how they oh. turn everything in. It, it, it sucks when they turn everything to a lecture. So I'm just going to, all right, I'm just going to be quiet because you're my older. I'm not going to talk back to you. And that's the difference between American kids. Like, they, they'll talk back no matter what. But with us brown people, if we talk back, we get smacked. So I remember the first time I saw a white friend talk back to their parents, dude. I was like, Dude, what are you doing? <laughs> That's your dad. <laughs> Did you just raise your voice? What are you doing? <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, I can. It's like my parents are the exact same way. It's insane. Yeah, I was always I was always afraid of my parents. Yeah. Oh, and like 100%. Since, still am. Yeah, since I'm getting older too, like they're still fixated on like the old ways of getting married they, they they want to do an arranged marriage and i'm like no i'm not doing arranged marriage dude i have a girlfriend and i'm in love with her uh we'll see how it goes if it goes good then it goes good if it goes bad it goes bad i'll find another one but i don't want you finding someone for me because i know what i like you don't know what i like even though you think you know me you don't know me because i have things that i've hid from you because i don't want to like i said you but you just think i'm wrong this is just a phase, you know, like back in high school, you, got, you, you go through a lot of phases while growing up, but then those phases, they, they either stay or they become part of you. And mm -hmm. um, they, they don't know that because you, you're too afraid to open up to them. So, and I'm, I'm afraid to open up my parents because, you know, uh, me and Chris, we, we got through like that depression during high school. And I, I'm st I still get seasonal depression right now. And I don't want to open up to my depression to them because they they've gone through the harsh realities of immigrating over here so that's the only real hard life uh, decisions that they've gone through is that's that's pretty hard for them and then mine's just emotional they've gone through physical emotional trauma like that so that's all you know is that that immigration yeah. um what is it you experience you feel like you're uh, like any emotional pain that you go through is like minimized because you didn't almost like you it may it it's because it's not right. Like any pain or sadness or any emotion that, you know, you feel that we feel is valid. But I do get that, like, you know, when you have parents that come from more difficult upbringings, you get a fit, you get a sense of like guilt for like yeah. complaining about things or feeling like not happy about something like, yeah, I totally get that because. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, yeah, they, they've actually done research like this last few years ago about the Khmer Rouge and how it affected those people. And that depression and trauma, it, 
it's been passed down through their genes. So I, I, I believe it because like, I don't know why I'm depressed because I don't know where it stemmed from, but it's it stemmed from them being traumatized by seeing that war, experiencing that that trauma. So I I, I don't have any re, uh, sources for that, but there is, there is research of that passed down trauma. Yeah. I think trauma is definitely can it, it is inherited like when it comes to yeah, especially if you're a, a member of any sort of oppressed like community. Like how how could you not I don't know. Like, how could you have like solid mental health and come mm-hmm. from either a situation you're experiencing, like you're describing with your family, or if you grow up in the United States and you're indigenous and you grow up on a reservation with shitty resources because the federal government doesn't do anything for you and your family? Like, yeah, how, like, yeah, that's just generations of people that got fucked over year after year. And mm-hmm. yeah, that died, that shit for sure passes through generations. You know, like, how can you not, how can you not, like, you see that even as a kid and like yeah. understand it so you, you, your parents like going through this like trauma like this tough experience do you think they like they understand like they like grasp the idea of like mental health uh, or do you think that's lost on their generation i think it's there it's just they don't know how to express it you know they're, they're too afraid to talk about it or they'll talk about it but they'll leave some stuff out Every time I ask them about the, that history, they're like, "Oh yeah, we came this way, or this is this is how we got out." But they they don't go into full detail. They just give me like little snippets of how it affected them. So I guess it's hard for me to also express mental health to them and just people who are close to me in general. So you've never like opened up to them about this kind of stuff. I mean, I, I told them about it, but it's just like it wasn't getting through to them. They're just like, oh, you'll be okay. You just got to hey, eat something. You'll feel, you'll feel okay. But I eat. Oh, yeah. Like, I'm so food, sad. Yeah, food will fix it. Yeah. Um, well, the reason I bring that up is because um, – so, I mean, yeah, obviously um, it, it's tough, you know, when you have like that emotional pain. Obviously, like I'm not saying that's a good thing, but like me having been – like I came here from Mexico, right? So um, – I'm allowed to be sad, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know? you're, you're the you're the person we're talking about. Yeah, dude. Yeah, you guys, you're emotional. No, dude, hey, try going to a different country, dude. Yeah, without a <laughs> without an iPhone, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so okay. So the reason I bring it up is because recently, um, actually this morning we were talking a lot about mental health in my um, over breakfast because uh, my parents didn't really understand that. Um, that was like never a topic of discussion. In Mexico, like even um, like amongst like not immediate family members, but when you're talking to friends or anyone, like you don't disclose you don't disclose that information. Like if someone you know is going through a tough time, like you just don't talk about it even now. Like mm-hmm. um, like that's your bit. Like cause I've noticed that with me, it's like um, I've I inherited that from them from like like being raised like that, where it's like I don't air my business out to anyone. Like obviously sometimes like I'll talk you know about how I'm feeling and stuff, but it's like. My business, my family, that's like, I'm not going to talk to anyone else about that unless it's like on a podcast being put like on the internet for like whoever. But um, so we were talking about mental health and my, I went through a tough time at, a, at one point, um, you know, like sleeping a lot, not feeling very motivated, like kind of like very bleak outlook on life. Um, and luckily I got through it. Um, but like other members, like, um, in like my family circle obviously have gone through those problems um and it's tough that it took it took it took my parents like a while to realize that it was like a thing that can affect you and it's a thing that has to be like dealt with with more than just like food because like when i you would be sleeping all day like my mom would just like i'm like bang on the door like toot, 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 toot. you know, get your ass out of bed like you need to do something and like that's not gonna fix anything um yeah. and it just took my parents a really long time but after 20 years being here like now they finally like acknowledge that mental health is like something that's serious and needs to be like addressed by a medical professional um and it's not just like feeling sad um do you like either of you guys like do you, do you have they like come to that realization or are they still kind of in like the mindset where it's just like oh well like if you just don't feel if you just don't think about it you'll you're not depressed i've gotten a few of those answers but i 
I kind of lucked out in a way. It doesn't sound very lucky, but lucked out in a way that I have a family like plagued on both sides with just her like hereditary generalized anxiety disorder. So I have like a lot of people in my family that like when I talk about being like a hypochondriac about freaking out about things about like making a really big deal over like small things and obsessing over stuff. Like I have a lot of people that relate to me about that in my family. The only thing is I don't see a lot of people that did the next step of like seeking like professional help. So like there's a lot of like talking about it within like, you know, your family, which is good. But the thing is, it's like fam- while family is like super important to me and should be important they're also biased. Like it's your parents and it's your family that you know, and like have like a million interactions with a day, maybe like, I think you need to have that other thing. And that, whether it be like, you know, friends are really close to, or some, or have the privilege and can afford to go seek like actual professional help. But, um, that's what I saw in my upbringing at, at least is just like a lot of like, just, Let's just not, let's just like keep running in circles of like, we know what's wrong. We know what's wrong. Let's talk about it. But nothing's really being like done to like actually change it. Um, so that's why I'm super grateful for the friends that I had growing up because yeah, probably would have gotten a lot worse. <laughs> yeah. Chris, like I'm, I'm glad I had you in the group to like open up my, my feelings because my family, we just hit everything like we just, we just hit our emotions from each other because we just always focused on, hey, let's just live our lives. You know, we just want to be happy, happy, happy all the time. If you're sad, don't tell me, don't talk about it. If you're sad, just get over it. You know, yeah. Cause whenever I, whenever I would cry or get sad, like my my mom and dad would be like, hey, stop, stop it. You know, and that <laughs> and that's not healthy. It's like, hey, stop crying. Growing up, like whenever I cry, hey, stop, stop. Yeah. It, so like it, they, see, I, they see the tears and they're like, hey. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's not healthy. And talking to my girlfriend, like whenever she wants me to open up, I'm like, I don't want to open up. It's it's just how I was raised. Like you don't open up about your your yeah. soft emotional side like that because then you just get chastised. Like, hey, that's not cool. Just be happy. That, so, dude, that's so, that's so, so true. Because you get conditioned. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. you get like, See, and that the conditioning is like can only it leads you one or two ways because yeah, and my girlfriend Christina, hello if you're listening, um, you, the thing that the thing that happened with my friends, you know, like because I was raised in that environment where family did talk about these things and like we're gonna talk about it, but we don't do anything about it. That's that's my flaw. So like that's where people get frustrated with me. Like you you mentioned with your girlfriend Nathan, like like Christina conversations, like okay, like you're feeling this way you know what's wrong why aren't you like taking like real steps to fix it? i'm like well I, I, I don't know i just did i told you about it what else it, you want me exactly. to do exactly so like i grew up kind of thinking that like that's all that mattered like i told someone that i that that it was wrong or that i was feeling like weird now nah, i don't got to do anything about it <laughs> like that involves like my own personal my changes. job is done <laughs> yeah my girlfriend she has to talk about it and like get it out of her system in order to move on but with me she's like why can't i just be like you to bottle it up and not feel like, anything you don't, you don't want yeah this. it's like oh. you don't want to be like that you like, don't want this dude. you don't want it because like when, you, when, I, when i just bottle it up i just become numb i'm like all right it's whatever like that's my my saying whenever i'm like sad or mad i'm like it's whatever it's whatever and it's not healthy i mean it's just the way i was growing up it's like it's whatever i'll get over it so and i've, I've still done nothing to improve myself get better because i don't know how they didn't give you bad habits yeah it's a bad habit yeah yeah you didn't get that you can't blame yourself man or Mm -hmm. you know it's hard to it's hard to blame one it's not you can't blame one thing you know with this kind of shit (laughs) or could you i don't know you can't i for me it was like it wasn't so um like my brother and my older sister, like they had already moved out by the time I was going through like that, the, just adolescence. And, um, I didn't understand how to like deal with anything. Um, and like, I know we didn't really talk about like that kind of stuff. Um, but I just like, I just remember like eventually like little by little, I was like, I have to talk about my emotions. I have to tell them how I feel. And it'd be like over the dinner table and they'd be like, Oh, like, you know, how, how you doing? How's school? Blah, blah, blah. And I'd just be like staring at like my meat 
or whatever I'm eating. And I'd be like, <laughs> I'm sad. But, you know, like I just like very ne- like just a Neanderthal learning how to speak. Just like one word at a time. Just like must speak emotion. Yeah. Drunk hey, sad. Pedro, you, miss- you mentioned this yesterday. Like, oh, he never comes out of his room because he's shy. You know, like. Yeah, right. <laughs> And that was me too. Like I never talked because I was too scared, you know, just just to open up to people. I was just shy. I was just like, I wonder what they're gonna think of me, you know, just yeah. that insecurity of showing who you re- who you are to people. But, but yeah, M- mistaking like just being like a little nervous, shy kid for like actual like s- like serious pain behind yeah. why you're not talking. Serious social anxiety yeah yeah dude i used to be so fucking shy it's like cringy how shy i used to be like i would be like yeah. afraid to like see like family like i like going to like large family parties like scared the shit out of me like having like interact with a bunch of people that like i fringely knew or like only see from time to time like i hated talking to people hated it I would like it's outside person that if people were coming to our house to like visit. I would like immediately as I saw their like car pull in, I like hide in room. my room as much yeah. as possible. Yeah, oh. growing up, like I went to two elementary schools and three middle schools. So just starting over again, it sucks because you're like, oh my God, I have to do this again. I have to do this again. Why do I have to do this again? Like, Wait, how many times did you start over? Start, start, so new schools? I went to two elementary schools and three middle schools. And yeah, Dude. especially in, the, in that middle school, like yeah, frame, that's the worst age. It's, it's the worst because people are like very in their own zone and like. Or yeah. or silver lining, you had five chances to reinvent yourself. <laughs> you could have shit yourself in middle school in the middle of like an assembly and then gone to a new one, been a brand new kid, <laughs> show up with shades and a hat. Yeah. I don't know, leather jacket or something. By, be like, yeah, by, cool by your third, by your third middle school, you're like, you know, I'm gonna be a beanie guy. <laughs> yeah, I was that beanie guy, Chris. Yeah, he was. <laughs> and, and I was a star running back, you know. Dude, he was. That's facts. That's where I'm, that's where all my emotions was was on the field, baby. Like it was it was almost <laughs> absurd. Like eighth grade lightweight football. Nathan scored like every touchdown we ever had. It was and insane. Field. Me and Alec, bro, the duo. Oh, and I'd love to see Alec on a football field. Nathan was a star running back. Do you um, I I always wished I always wished like so bad you know like the coming of age like teen, uh like uh, movies like of the '90s and stuff where there's always that scene where like they're showing the new guy around the school and then like they go to the cafeteria and they show all the clicks. It's like mm-hmm. in Mean Girls. It's like in Ten Things I Hate About You. Um, plenty more that I just can't think of right now. Did you ever get that? Is that a thing that happened anywhere in the world? Like where did that trope come from? Not sure. It's just like, hey, it's, it's the new kid. He's probably the new not kid over here. He was that new kid, and you're just playing with like a butterfly knife, and then you get <laughs> expelled. I only started at new schools when it would be kind of normal to not know everybody. Cause like I, I was in Catholic school for elementary school, and then I went to public middle school. But that middle school was being feeded into by like a bunch of different elementary schools, so it wasn't as weird to be like. I didn't. I it, it was weird that I didn't really know anybody, but I mean, it wasn't that weird to like not to like. Yeah. You know, it's not like it. It's not like everybody was like super clicky from the start because you're coming in from so many different schools. Yeah, I guess I've never started like. I feel like that would only happen like if you start in the middle of the school year or something. I don't know. Yeah, that was how dude. That was how I met Nathan. Um, was it middle school year? It's seventh grade. Yeah, you. Yeah. yeah, math, math class. That's where I met Nathan. It's like, <laughs> it's like oh. uh Oh, parents, you think you have a hard because you went to a new country? I went to a new middle school. I think no Nathan was wearing man. a I think Nathan was wearing a Neff hoodie, if I remember. Yeah, dude. Sick. I still remember what yeah, you and you had I remember that. This might have been that year. I don't know. You, you were wearing red um checkered vans slot uh, with uh with the ones that you just slip on. Heck yeah, dude. Heck yeah, man. Well, uh Nathan, do you remember what he was wearing? I was wearing like a Nike shirt with some elite socks, some sh- oh. shorts, you know. Now, nah, man, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, seventh grade probably. I was, <laughs> like, I was still, I was still like, dude, I'm an athlete. <laughs> Even though I'm like kind of overweight. <laughs> I'm like, damn, dude, I'm like, like, like moderately like a like a random like like middle school chub, but 
I'm a basketball star. I'm also just bulking. Had, like, I also had like the mop long hair that just swooshed to the side. I didn't. I don't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know that I was wearing I was wearing a blue polo and khakis because I wore a uniform from fifth to twelfth grade. Um, you go to private school? No, they thought that uh, bringing uniforms to public schools would help with the ad- behavior issues. Interesting. I don't know if I, I don't know if it helped. <laughs> no, your mental health wasn't good all throughout high school because just solely because you were wearing a uniform. Not j- for like all those years of not having to think about what I was wearing and just being like, it it got me ready for the workforce. Got me ready to wear a suit and tie every day. Made me numb. That training. Yeah, dude, they're conditioning us. Um, yep. evil, <laughs> evil, evil. Um. I actually have a question um, because, you know, with like when it comes to generations, traditionally, you know, the person that comes here. Um, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Um, there, I did just, I did, I made a note earlier because I wanted to circle back to this. Oh yeah, go um, ahead. You, so, so Nathan, you were talking about uh, how they wanted to do an arranged marriage. Now, so in in my case, my parents have like a very small circle of because it's just like not uh, they just haven't met too many people that they like clicked with, so they don't have a huge circle of like Mexican like friends here. Um, do do your parents have that in? Um... Yeah. So what they want to do with the arranged marriage is like um. So my yeah. uncle, he married a woman from Cambodia, and they brought that woman here. So now they're living in Albany, you know, just living their life so they my parents want me to marry my aunt's niece but we aren't blood related but we're related through marriage and it's weird because the niece looks like my aunt and i'm like bro i don't want to do that oh you know? yeah the plot also, thickens yeah and also like just like the like the cultural differences you know like i'm, I'm americanized and she's pure Cambodian woman over there doesn't know anything about American culture and I'm over here like dude I like indie rock I like hip hop <laughs> I like to eat all kinds of foods but I can't cook for myself <laughs> you know it's it's diff- it's a different culture between me and then the people over there so it it would be very very different transition transition to get to know each other even though i don't even know her they just want me to go there get married and then bring her back over here just to get a green card and have her family have a better life over here over here so that's like that's right. it's not like they have like like they're like oh here's a lot of options that we're mulling over yeah. i'm not I, i'm honestly not familiar how, with how that works but they're just yeah. like okay we have this one this one person we have in mind and that like that's it like that all yeah. all, all um eggs in that basket yeah, so they're, they're they're sort of like grooming their family to like make them make them more like yeah we'll marry your son because you're giving us money you're giving us like these things to know that you guys have money so to bring our daughter over to America and she'll she'll have a better life and I'm like oh, I I don't know man no. Bro, I can't imagine that like pressure because then yeah. that's like I mean I'm not saying it's on you because it's totally not but just like if I was in that position I'd be like oh this like they want a better life and all this stuff, and I do not yeah. want to participate. It, I, it, it seems harsh, but like I'm thinking of it as like adopting a dog and giving that dog a better life. So I don't. It seems kind of harsh to say, but that's what it feels like. I'm like I'm taking this person away from this one place to bring into my my life so I can provide for them, you know, and they'll they'll provide for me in in one way or another, but it's. It's it's weird, yeah. It's weird yeah but yeah. but but then there there are like some arranged marriages marriages that that work out. You know they they they're in love and they have a good life. But I don't know. I don't know how how it would be for me. Especially, I mean, you said yourself you, you you're Americanized, so it's like not even like it is part of your culture, but like not the culture that like you've you've grown up and come to like yeah. identify with. Yeah, dude, that is that is gnarly, as they say in my home country. <laughs> 
Good old Southern Mexico. California. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> All right, so yeah, I cut you off there, Chris, but yeah, you can continue. I just I was curious about that. Yeah, yeah. No, I was gonna say this kind of goes into um I I don't know what I guess section of what stuff we wanted to say this goes into, but I was just thinking, um to, you know, in, in general, like Nathan, like obviously your parents, your grandparents are the people that came here. You're born here. Pedro, you came here with your parents. Like, how do you guys, do you guys think that, like, as far as your individual upbringings, you, know, you can speak on to that, like how your individual upbringings and your parents, like specific, like circumstances um, influenced, like your ability to like have like a relationship with them, like, like what, like. You know, like the the tr- traditional trope is that, like, you know, because they're immigrants, like immigrant parents often have to work harder. They have to be away from the home often, more often because there's like, you know, you're not provided as many opportunities if, you know, a lot of them come here to be like, like unskilled workers or stuff that's deemed like, you know, like shitty shit. Like my, like my grandpa for my grandpa, for example, um, picking uh, fruit and vegetables in the fields for like his whole life while he was here like that was all he did it was just it was a just a field worker um and that, that, that takes up a lot of time and my 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 dad's mom worked in the canneries so like that kind of work like takes you like away from like a household like for a, a long time that you don't get offered the privileges of like when your parents have like white collar jobs you know and like you're able to like they get like an x amount of vacation time you know that you get to do like this together like the more like erratic like schedules like what what do you guys i guess think about that as like a difference 20 years my family has not been on a single vacation fuck nah my mom went to san francisco once that was nice just her though <laughs> not the family <laughs> yeah it was just we just had enough money for her <laughs> um actually dude i i got super lucky my parents worked um I got lucky they didn't they they worked factory jobs for like a good chunk of time or like construction jobs like stuff you know they go in early and then work however long and then they'd be done early so I'd see them in the afternoons and they for the most part would usually have weekends off and honestly dude like bless like they were they went to every one of my band concerts like every one of my um games wrestling meets dude they went to everything and it's insane um that they did that because i sucked so bad at sports <laughs> they're working 60 hours in the factory and they come watch me get pinned in the second round of a wrestling match dude like fuck man they blo- they they're they were great dude i honestly like i i can't imagine like th- that work ethic they had and they still had energy to deal with me like, that's bonkers um yeah i guess with me i got kind of lucky too because before the the genocide happened, uh, there's already people already coming to America to live a better life and start their own businesses, and um, uh, so we had kind of connections here who would help us establish ourselves with our own business. And so, if you didn't know, a lot of Cambodian people own donut shops, and if you know a little history here, uh, you know pink donut boxes. You know, you get like a box of donuts yeah. and it comes in a pink box. A Cambodian man started that that fad. You know. Back in the no 80s. Way. Yeah. His name is Ted Noy. But anyways, uh, my dad, he learned how to make donuts from uh, a, f- a family friend or somebody. And then moved to Oregon and they ha- started their own business. And so all my life, they've we just had our own donut shop business. And growing up, my dad would make the donuts and my mom would sell them. My, my uncle would help make the donuts too. So my, my dad and my uncle would come in at night, make the donuts. My mom would come in early in the morning till like the early afternoon to sell them and during the time of me growing up with my sisters my my mom wouldn't uh let us sleep at the house while they go to work she would put us in the trunk of the car and have us sleep in the trunk of the car take us to work with them and then we'd wake up in the trunk of the car and go inside the donut shop and just chill until they got off work you know because they didn't want us to leave us home alone they want us to have them in their sight how old were you at this point just i was growing up like all throughout my years like just just like yeah yeah so you're like 15 and you wake up in the trunk and you're like okay time to get the day started like from dude as early as i can remember like when i was a toddler like 
Wow, that's, and, and so they never like were. They never had like babysitters to watch us. I mean, they would have they would have like their cousins who were like in their teenage years watch us sometimes, but they, as far as I know, they would just try and take us to work every every morning just to have us there with them and like help them. I would help them out clean and yeah. stuff. You know, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say this next sentence, knowing that child protective services can't do anything about it now. Um, but I remember my parents leaving me home alone a lot, like as early as like first grade. Is yeah. that? I mean, what was I like six? Yeah, I remember just like chilling on the couch, being like, "Yeah, no one's home. I guess this is this is life." Um, <laughs> and then I just didn't realize now until I had like I have nephews that are that age. I'm like, I don't know if I trust you being home alone that long. But I guess obviously, like you know, when you don't have a choice, they worked at factories, like I said, so I, you can't really have a six year old just like bopping around like that heavy machinery and stuff. Yeah, I will say, completely side comment, but. The donuts that Nathan's family makes are fucking amazing. Yeah, do you want to shout out the business name or not? Nah? Uh, yeah, it's it's outside San Luis Obispo. Ob- Obispo? It's in Atascadero, California. Uh, it's called Sunrise Donuts. It's, it, it's in a little shithole town, Atascadero. Probably drive by. We are <laughs> south of San Francisco. If you're ever in that mid-central area, go check it out. Shouts out my- the business, shits yeah. on the town. <laughs> My yep. dad was so pissed when his parents moved out of Salem because my dad loved going to their donut Dude, shop. Dude, I'm pretty sure like a lot of people were just, just pissed because we, we closed up and just left. We didn't yeah, dude. Like, they just dipped. And like my dad used to get their donuts like every Sunday. Yeah. And it was I, just like a change of scenery. Like business was going good and everything. You just wanted to move? No, nah, it's just better business down in California because they would make more money. In Salem, there's, there's a little more competition, but... Uh, not enough money coming in, so they they always go where the money is. That's why they they moved. What about yeah. what about you, Chris? Um, mine's kind of unique. I mean, because obviously, I got a weird like uh, my dad was born in Mexico, but mostly raised here. Mom's family is like my mom's dad on my mom's side. On both sides, I'm like fifth generation American. So like I've had like. I've had like, I've had the pleasure of like my parent. I'm not the first generation of going to college. My pa- my parents, my 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 dad was the first generation to go to college, um. So I had that, and then my mom, um, her mom had already gone to college, but she was the first person in her. So it's like I had these like role models to like look after that had that did that were the trailblazers that like, you know, forged that path for themselves. So I had the privilege of like my parents having white collar jobs the entire for pretty much the entire time um but there was a brief period where my mom my my her dad my grandfather used to own like a lot of restaurants in the area and she in between um when we were like very little i think as a way to make like money she would like waitress at their um restaurant because i always remember like going to that restaurant like hanging out and eating free food but my dad's always owned his own business from the beginning that he got here um he is self-employed as um, a business consultant and just pr- and predominantly works with um, the Latino community here in, in Salem to um, start businesses. So he's helped people that are that have immigrated start their own like landscaping company, their own painting company, um, uh, window wa- like he, he's helped a lot of those type of people start businesses and get contracts and get the type of stuff they the assistance that they need from the state to get on the ground running um so yeah with that they i I, i'm blessed with it because you know when you're self-employed you make your own schedule so my parents are always like completely adapted to whatever was going on in our lives um yeah meanwhile i was just home alone playing with the stove (laughs) yeah my dad dropped out of school when he was 13 they just told me that they just they just finally told me like the actual age a couple weeks ago because they'd always be like, yeah, your dad didn't really finish school. I mean, like he's he's got, you know, he's a very smart man. Uh, he's like a great mechanic and, you know, does a lot of good stuff with his hands. Um, but can you imagine dropping out 13? It's insane. That is so young. Yeah, my parents graduated high school and then started their own business together. So it's a pale life. For them, it's nuts, dude. Dude, thirteen is so young. 
<laughs> what the fuck, dude? Um, I can't even like if I was like, I can't even imagine being 13 years old and like asked, being like, all right, <laughs> all right, this is the real world. <laughs> time to get a job, okay? Yeah, I asked him. I was like, I was like, what'd you do? And he was like, yeah, I just played soccer. Like I just played soccer and like um I was like you fucking Mexican. No, <laughs> he did play soccer and then he did odd jobs and then you know he would make enough to like get by and then once he like you know realized that he like oh yeah enough for like a week or like a you know month or however long and he just go back to just playing soccer with his friends. That's insane. It's insane life. But um yeah, do you guys think um. You guys think you could do what your uh, what your parents did? Uh, I'm gonna say hell no. I'm too soft, and I don't know anything because they 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 did the trial and error, so they know what's what's good. And I I try to do that, but then you just get mad at me for doing the trial and error kind of thing, because they 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 kind of expect me to know what they know, but then I don't know what they know. You get what I'm saying? Like, you you have all these tools of success. Like, you should know how to do everything. But mm-hmm. then I do it, and I get it wrong. They're like, why did you do that? You should have just done this. I'm like, well, I didn't know. You didn't tell me. So they kind of just expect me to know better. Yeah, we raised you. You should have our entire knowledge base. Yeah, yeah. By heart. Yeah. Um. I'm going to go ahead and also say hell no. I don't know. Well, I could probably have dropped out at 13 and played soccer. I think I could have done that much. Um, not much else, though. I was actually just talking about... Um, so I asked them... You know, I knew we were going to be talking about some of this stuff. So over uh, lunch, I asked them some stuff. Um, and the thing with my parents is that they like know a little bit about a lot of very practical things. They know a good amount of like a lot of practical knowledge on like just how to exist in general um that and and that's like you know how they've gotten by that's like you know how they survived it's like you pick a little bit here and there um and then somehow i just don't have any of that and i and so i think that's why i would probably have a tough time doing like half of what you know they accomplished or did that's crazy dude i yeah even i don't think i could do any of uh no i'm no i'm going farther back too to like if I'm on like my dad's side, like my grandpa that was the first person to come here. Like I don't even think I could do fucking couldn't do that shit. I don't even know I could be my own dad. Like my like growing up in essentially, I mean, he like it hid it from us for a while, but essentially grew up in poverty. Um and went to college being the oldest and graduated and then started his own business and g- has given me the cushy life that I've grown up with where dad hasn't been so difficult on I mean hasn't been so easy on a like a social level when it comes to you know being a minority but as far as material things like has always provided and made sure that I had everything and put us before him and yeah I I don't think I could do it either because I just it it sucks the only this the shittiest thing about being I think about growing up here and having the privilege of knowing what your parents, your grandparents, great grandparents, whatever didn't have is the like selfishness that you can easily get like trapped in or maybe creeps up and like fucks with you a little bit of like you know, for forgetting that at times. That's where I get sad. I'm like, dude, why did I just like Yeah. Why did I just lash out at my parents or like do something stupid? Like, or maybe why, why, like, why do I sometimes treat it as an inconvenience to like give my grandparents a call? Like, shit like that. Yeah, I get that. That's just so, kind of messed up, dude, honestly. <laughs> dude, it's like, yeah, because like, I'm <clears throat> like, you know, real life happens and you for, you know, you, the, the real, the material world and what it takes to like succeed oftentimes doesn't want you to think about that stuff. So now you're like, Oh, this is, this is these family. This is, these are distractions to like, you know, my individual pursuit of something, but it's not the way it should be. Like, that's not the way that you need to think about it. But I think I get caught up thinking 
either previously and I'm trying to unlearn, but like did at times like get caught up in like it's your own individual search of something rather than realize like what a collective like family unit and support like provides. Like it's not just you out there. You don't need to think about it that way. And you know, to anybody listening, if you have like family like, issues, doesn't have to you don't have to think about it that way. Um, as far as like you being completely uh, alone. Yeah, I think that's a, like a big difference in like mentality. Um, <clears throat> that, I mean, I guess yeah, we we're we're a little more selfish because like whenever I ask my parents questions, that I like I'm kind of like directing them more at like at them specifically, I find that they are always answering in like generalized terms or like, um, it's not, it's like they're, they're always, their answer is like always like us, we like, you know, I, I don't know if you guys have experienced that, but I think I, I like, I've, I've started to notice it more as an adult whenever I come to them, like for things is that they have like a different mindset. Oh, like more collective. Yeah, yeah, that's the word, collective, yeah. Definitely, like, the way they approach things. It's like more like, it's not just like, what am I going to do? What do I, like, need here? It's like, it's like a broader scope, which is yeah. crazy. Also a little frustrating when I try and, like, deep dive, you know, when I'm trying to get, like, I don't like, for example, so, so I wanted to talk today about, like, how, if you guys had any ideas of, like, how to preserve, like, your cultural identity, like, um while still being accepted in the U.S. and, like, potentially, like, in the future when you have kids, what are you going to, you know, be doing? And I asked him, um, and <laughs> it was just, it, it turned into a lecture, but, like, when I was, like, I was, like, what can I do to, like, preserve my cultural identity? And he was, like, just started talking about, like, well, us, us, the Mexican people, we're a proud people, and just, like, went into this, like, whole thing. And I was, like, that's not what I asked, dude. <laughs> Fuck yeah, dude. I think he ended up at one point listing every holiday we celebrate as Mexicans. What the fuck does that? Have? Uh, did he say like to to keep it? You gotta celebrate all those in your house. I was like, I was like, are you saying we should? Because we don't celebrate half of those. I was like, I was like, I don't know for a fact we haven't celebrated like most of those. Um, and he was like, yeah, but it's a sad thing we don't. I was like, <laughs> Basically, <laughs> he didn't answer my question. So <laughs> maybe you damn near should. We damn near <laughs> should be celebrating all of them. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 weird. Or maybe my parents just don't like me, and they're just like, hey, I'm gonna talk about my own shit today. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but so what do you guys think? I mean, like, how do we do you do you have that like drive or like do you feel that? Like do you want to preserve things or are you just like I'm American? Yeah, I I definitely want to preserve like our culture within the younger generation. And this is what uh people were <clears throat> talking about back in college, like with the newer generation, it's kinda harder to preserve our culture because we're surrounded by a whole mixing pot of different cultures, different mindsets here in America. So it's kind of hard to instill that we are, we, we have this culture that's so unique to us that we should keep it going. And one thing is like, is our language, you know, um, with my niece, I, I try to talk to her in, in Laotian, but she still responds to me in English. So it's, it's kind of hard for, to like make them, not make them, but um, persuade them to, to keep this this culture within them alive rather than losing it fully because once it's gone you, it's it's kind of hard to get it back you know yeah. especially with like our food our food's pretty unique our the way we we dress it's pretty unique it's just who we are so is what makes us distinct between other people you know but pr culture is definitely definitely something unique to everybody so it's it's, yeah. it's a good thing to preserve and that that's the I think that's the hard part about this question too though is because how do you as far as you know your own children and the way we grew up like how do you how do you do that at the same time like preserving things incorporating like traditions that are nor like to you like food dress stuff like that celebrating holidays while at the same time give yourself permission to be like open to other things you know because I feel like I feel like that that line is sometimes like drawn like really sharply and I don't think it needs to be drawn as sharply like you're either with them or you're with us like type of shit um cuz I don't I I mean, I don't know like the funny thing about me when it comes to this type of question is I already feel like um I feel like 
I'm looking at what my parents did and then trying to evaluate for like how I would do it differently just because like, again, all respect to them. And I know we talked about this on a previous episode of just like my inability to speak Spanish, like very well, like Spanish sucks. Absolute dog shit. I can like get, I say your Spanish sucks or Spanish in general sucks. I said my Spanish sucks. I cut off. Like, (laughs) like, um, uh, I have like survival Spanish. Like, I have, like, traveler Spanish. Like, I'm going to be able to ask for directions. I'm going to be able to order off of a menu, like, that type of thing. But, like, I don't have the ability to, like, have, like, really, like, unique and, like, in-depth conversations with people. And that is something that I don't know. Like, am I going to need to, like, learn it so that I would then be able to pass it on? Because, like, what I have now doesn't seem like passing something on if I, like, do have, like, a child. Like, what am I going to be... I'm preserving my language. My kid knows how to order in Spanish at the, the, the taco truck. <laughs> yes, like, sir. I don't know if that counts as, like, preservation. This is my culture. <laughs> yeah, do you know, like, living in Oregon, I didn't, I didn't have anybody to talk to, bro. So I have, my language skills suck. The only person I talked to was my grandma and my grandpa back in Oregon. And all my, all my cousins just spoke English to each other. So I was like, well... Okay, well, I can't practice my language skills here. And when I moved down to South Carolina, all my cousins, all my aunt and uncles, they talk to each other in Thai. Thai, Thai and Lao are kind of similar language. But mm-hmm. um, and every time my my aunt and uncles try to talk to me in Thai, I'm like, I don't know what you're saying. And they're like, Well, you gotta learn how to speak your language. I'm like, Oh yeah, but back home, I I didn't really have anybody to talk to, so if I don't know the language that well, or I don't know any of it. So that's that's what I'm trying to like learn right now is, is the yeah. language because when you have that language you have that a better connection with them, with your with your um with your family like you have that special bond that what makes you you what makes you connected to your culture yeah so, it's just hard because I didn't grow up speaking it that much well it's, it sounds foo foo but it really is true. Like the language unlocks like so many because you under you understand people better by speaking their language because when you're able to like it's like the fact that like you'll never be able to like perfect perfectly translate things in a different language into your language. And that's because like to truly know a language, like you understand like the culture in a deep way, like you know what these for what these like phrases these like sayings mean that don't directly translate like, like you're able to like understand that and like have like a personality and an opinion in that and that's what I don't like I still my Spanish is still in a way that like I I am looking to translate Spanish into English I don't just hear Spanish and I'm like within it is it's not like within me to where it's like I don't have to I'm I'm not my brain isn't still working to translate like like things yeah so during kind of Stirring on to like a different area of this, but like during the summer of my sixth to seventh grade, uh, I was a Buddhist monk for like two months, and we we had to learn the alphabet and we had to learn how to speak it. And during that time, dude, my language skills were on point. Like I was I was learning so much, and then of not practicing it, I just lost all my inability to read and write and and tie. So. I, I just lost the inability because I didn't practice it. You know, you just gotta keep practicing what you know and build on build on that and really further your knowledge. Yeah, so it's that, like every day, every day. Yeah. And you were at, you were at an age. You, and you were at an age. Would you wait? Well, I, I did I interrupt what? a joke? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, the point is I was like, that's why I want to get deported to speak Spanish every day. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was gonna say because Nathan, like, um, you were also at an age though which was beneficial like that's the age where like you can still grasp like shit like you know the older yep. we get fucking harder it's gonna be to actually like get any of this down at like a deeper level that's yeah, what's sad they just keep getting older <laughs> yeah yeah so i don't know i mean i don't know what i would do to pass it down i mean definitely like holidays and stuff and like me music but like music and stuff, shit like that. But that oh, that is also stuff that I like had to do a little bit of like digging on my own because I think like I was just raised super Americanized. Because it was like, besides my dad, like everybody else has like been here for a while. So, you know, kind of gone, kind of gone. Like I have specific like, 
my dad has specific siblings or specific people I can think of that like it's definitely like a larger part of their life. Um, but yeah, everybody makes that like individual choice. I don't know. Literally, like the only thing I can think of to like to like solve this, like it's not even a problem, but like like the best thing that I can think of is like to marry like an like someone that's like an art curator or one of those like fake high paying jobs, you know, where we can like live in Mexico half the year, live in like you know, and just like have really just well cultured kids. So it's not really about preserving the culture; it's more it's just like exposing them to more things and like. Yeah like immersing yourself like super deeply um uh, that's like you just, you could have just been all you could have just been all, like a white girl that studies abroad in Sevilla for a semester in Spain I honestly love that <laughs> more power to white girls that study in Spain yeah this uh this hey this episode goes out to white girls that study in Spain <laughs> <laughs> no this episode goes to the white girls that uh study in mexico Ooh, what's up not because you know like not as attractive as spain everybody wants to go to spain but the the ogs that go to to nueva españa mexico <laughs> yeah, those, those yeah, are the ogs this, hey this goes out to you we know it wasn't your first choice but spain was full up <laughs> yeah we know you didn't get into the spanish program but hey <laughs> the, the the university in mexico city just is fine we still love you <laughs> well oh man um, I should have done that. Should have studied abroad? In Mexico, yeah. I had a plan to do it, and I just didn't do it. Oh, that would have been sick. Yeah. I had a plan to do it before college, and once I got to college, I was like, I'm not doing that. What, what made you I'm too busy. Um, I don't know. I just got, like, ner- I, I get, I was like, I always, I always find reasons for to not do something. So I'll think of every reason to not do something, and I was just like, ah, oh, these are too many reasons to not do it, so I'm not going to do it. No. My shots aren't up to date. I probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> I haven't got damn. my TDAP booster shot. I'm like, yep, yeah, damn. I think there's gonna be something really good on TV during that three months. <laughs> I better stay. Mm, I think the Game of Thrones finale is that year. So, <laughs> yeah. See, couldn't do it. Not possible. Nope. I remember. Um, dude, I remember I, so for me, college was like just like a sleepy blur. I was like overworked. Um, just like I was. I think maybe for one semester I was averaging like two and a half hours of sleep a night. Um, and so I was like in a daze most of the time, but I remember like one time I was like, I left a class like to get, um, like a drink of water or something. I was just like walking out. I was like, the words weren't making sense. I was like in a fog. I was like, I'm just going to get a, get some water, like clear up. And like, I walked past the bulletin board and it was a study abroad program poster. And I was like, I remember thinking, I'm like, it just hallucinating just from like sleep deprivation, like the sun hitting my face is like i was like on a beach somewhere like studying abroad and i remember being like you know what my grades are pretty good like i have some money that i you know i could save up some money i could do this i could i could study abroad for a semester i'd be down to graduate later and i was just like running through all these scenarios in my head and i was like oh shit like (laughs) i can't travel abroad (laughs) i'm undocumented (laughs) and then my reality just came crashing down i just like went back to class and whatever i don't know that was a depressing story, but I remember that moment like pretty vividly. And that's all the feel... time we had for today, folks. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Not So Fresh Off the Boat. We're brown, but we're also sad. I was going to say, you're going to make me and Nathan feel bad for being citizens of the Stars and Stripes? The greatest country on earth. Fucking love Little bit country. of country fried, cold beer on a Friday night. Zach Brown Band? The, yeah, but you went, you, you're, you, you disappeared when you stood up. That was the most <laughs> horrifying thing I've ever seen. If anybody is, li- if anybody's listening to this and not watching it, because we we do upload, we will upload video of this podcast. Pedro just stood up and disappeared from the camera. That that what the he he is bl- completely blended into the Zoom background behind him. And uh, when I pull up, I'd be like. <laughs> 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 oh my god is this um <laughs> you guys you guys feel like we've we, we've covered enough have we uh have we wrapped up this episode anything else anybody wants to bring up or talk about yeah i mean uh nathan is there anything you want the people to know um about anything 
about your culture, about you personally? I don't know. I'm a cool dude. I think you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> I think Chris can vouch for that. Yeah, he's a cool dude. Both of you guys are cool dudes. I'm all I'm only friends with cool dudes. You hear that? If you're my friend, you're a cool dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I thought th- I thought this was a nice uh, way to get people information about uh, Asian American culture, of like my little spice of it. You know, there's definitely other things to talk about, but you know, I I never experienced it firsthand. You know, some some other people experiencing other things, but this is just what I've gone through. You know. Um, yeah. I think that that's all we can speak on what we've been through. Yeah, bro. Just speak your truth. That's all you can do. Um. All right. So I'm gonna hit stop record now. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Yeah, and, I think for tuning in. And um, yeah. Yeah. Every everybody uh, if you're white, tell your immigrant friends you love them. <laughs> Not just posting on like Instagram stories type shit. Like actually, like reach out to them. Not even immigrants. Not even just them, dude. Just anyone, dude. Any friend you got's going through a tough time. Because I know this episode talked about other mental health shit that didn't doesn't have to be you know just solely tied to the stuff we talk about here. Just reach out. Talk to somebody.